Oh, you guys did a pretty good job asking some interesting questions, so I cannot wait to go and answer them for you. Hey guys, welcome to another exciting episode of Q&A with Animat. And this time around, what we have here is actually some pretty good questions. Like, a lot of them that it did require me to think a lot about, but honestly, I think that this will result in a pretty fun and fascinating episode. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and go and answer our first question right over here, which is going to be coming from Hindu Frappe, which, I'm not gonna lie, actually does sound like a pretty good dessert. But anyways, uh, Hindu asks, who is your least favorite Disney character and why? Personally for me, it's the Goro Girls from Hunchback of Notre Dame. Now honestly that one, it took me a lot of thinking, but honestly for me, I would have to say Tarin from The Black Cauldron. Because the thing with that guy is that he is such a weak and pathetic character. Because throughout the whole thing, all he does is just wish to be this great knight, but never once does he ever prove himself that he could legitimately be a great knight. And for the most part, he did absolutely nothing throughout the whole film. Anything that would seem actually heroic, it would all be it would all be because of that magical sword. And even at the end of the film, it was actually Gurgi that would end up saving the day and actually defeating the Horn King. Meanwhile, Tarin is just there, doing absolutely nothing, thinking so highly of himself, when he did absolutely jack all. So, that's the thing. He's nothing more but a pathetic wannabe that literally is just nothing but a waste of time while the movie somehow thinks that he should be treated as the legitimate hero of the film. Uh, another one that I would say would be a part of my least favorite would have to be Chicken Little. I did think a little bit about this, but the main thing with Chicken Little is that the movie doesn't necessarily give us a reason to actually like the character, to think why we should sympathize with him or why why is it that he should be a character that we should go and root for but at the end of the day with how the movie ended up being constructed like it's such a mean-spirited film where it always points to chicken little that he's a loser and that everybody in the town absolutely hates him where even his dad has a bit of a distaste in him but I will give Chicken Little some credit that compared to Tarin, at least he does something in the movie. He does do some stuff where he is partly responsible of saving the day at the end of the movie. Where with Tarin, he did absolutely jack all. He's just someone who just wishes he wants to be a knight, does absolutely nothing to prove himself that he can be a knight, but outside of the factor that, oh, he did find this magical sword, which he ended up being lucky about it. Like, honestly, he's just a a an absolute waste. And yeah, he he's probably more useful as just a pig keeper. And that's it. And even at that, like, trying to make sure the pig is safe and all that stuff. Like, he sucks at it. Like, just like a few minutes. Like, give it 15 or 20 minutes and somehow... It ends up being in the hands of the Horn King, so yeah, he's nothing more but an absolute freaking screw-up! Okay, so with that question answered, let's go ahead and try to reverse that a little bit and go more into the positive aspect with another group of characters. So this one is going to be from Doombot, and Doombot asks, Animat, who is your favorite Disney villain? And that one honestly is a major toughie, like this is something that I've never really thought about regarding who would be my specific favorite animated villain. I do have several, like uh, Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty is uh, a great example of a fantastic and threatening villain uh, showing a lot of powers, uh, very devious and like you could see the inner workings of her mind on how she is such a definitive villain. Like even though yes, there isn't a lot about the character herself other than the fact that she is evil, but then again, it is just a fairy tale movie that really does sticks into telling this simple story. So for how the movie in for how the movie is constructed, she definitely is this fantastic villain and an amazing villain and 
it doesn't surprise me how people would even view her as the greatest Disney villain. Uh, other than that, there are a few others that I do enjoy as well. Syndrome is a great one from The Incredibles. Uh, another character that really has this very fascinating backstory on how he started out as this fanboy, but because Mr. Incredible dis doesn't live up to exactly his expectations, he becomes like his nemesis and like just goes all out crazy and even his plan on ultimately destroying all superheroes it actually does legitimately sound like it could work where turning everybody into a superhero means that there are no more superheroes and honestly i just find that pure genius and another one that i would say like if we go outside of disney i would go with lord shen from kung fu panda 2. i don't think dreamworks has yet to even make a villain that really is as strongly effective and someone who is as threatening as Lord Shen, especially when you have the whole setting where this is the man who technically invented the canon uh, during ancient times where martial arts is only the major weapon that they would have uh, at the time or at least in the world of Kung Fu Panda. So, for me, I don't know if I have a specific favorite animated villain, but I'll just go with those three. Maleficent, Syndrome, and Lord Shen. Now, our next question is going to be from Annie. And Annie asks right here, uh, Which movie backlash do you think had it the worst in your opinion? Despicable Me, Frozen, or Star Wars The Last Jedi, since you do consider loving those films? Well, honestly, this is a pretty easy answer, and that would have to be Star Wars The Last Jedi. Because when you do look at Despicable Me and Frozen, both of those films are pretty much hated by some people of the public uh, because of very similar reasons. And that's, long story short, the fact that they are popular. And these are the type of movies that very few people would go and consider them to be like the worst animated films or like the worst movies ever, but it's mainly because of the overexposure in our society and the way how they are very prominent in our pop culture that it is near impossible to walk five minutes and not see something related to either Elsa or the Minions. So it's mostly from people who are just sick and tired of seeing either something Frozen related or Despicable Me related everywhere. So yeah, for the most part, those people who hate Frozen and Despicable Me, it's mainly because they just want to feel cool for hating something that is popular. But with Star Wars The Last Jedi, on the other hand, that's where things really do take it way too far. And there are too many people out there that would hate this with a burning passion, and they would take it so personally. Like, they would react as if Star Wars The Last Jedi actually did kill their parents, or something like that. And the way that people are reacting to it, the way that people would go and express their hatred towards Star Wars The Last Jedi is honestly just ludicrous and their behavior would even be considered dangerous. Especially when you go and look onto social media, the way that they would even go and attack others. And I don't mean just like some of your typical cartoon community evil shenanigans where they would go and harass the filmmakers or even anybody who actually does enjoy The Last Jedi, I mean more the fact that they would go as far as they would bully and like harass HARD on people who actually did work on the feature. You probably heard the news about how Daisy Ridley or Kelly Marie Tran have to delete their social media because they have been constantly get bullied, getting death threats, and getting absolutely harassed by people who just don't like Star Wars The Last Jedi. And it really is affecting their lives in such a negative way. And it's honestly just crazy. And with this kind of behavior, it really does shed such a negative light on those who do not like Star Wars The Last Jedi. Like, honestly, I'm just gonna say it right now. Like, if you really think that it is justifiable the way that the filmmakers and the actors have been treated because of Star Wars The Last Jedi, like, if you think it's okay that those people have been harassed because of just simply doing their job 
uh, making a movie and stuff like that, then honestly, I don't care what you think. Whatever opinion you have, it is just absolutely invalid. And with the way that people have been attacking Kelly Marie Tran and all those people who worked on The Last Jedi, yes, those people are racist. Those people are sexist. And a lot of those people, they're nothing more but just pathetic incels who are just frustrated over the fact that they're not having as much sex as they want. Or in many cases, with most incels, they're just not having sex at all. Now, I will say though, this does not necessarily reflect on literally everybody who does not like Star Wars The Last Jedi. Now, I know that there are some people out there who would go and criticize Star Wars The Last Jedi, but just look at it as just a movie. Because at the end of the day, that's all that it is. It's nothing more than just a movie. So I will say that if you are a person who would criticize Star Wars The Last Jedi, like if you don't think it's a good movie and you treat it as just a movie, and if in your list of problems with the film, it does not include the words diversity, SJWs, or feminism, that would tell me that you are a mentally functioning human being with valid opinions worth listening to. But yeah, honestly, at the end of the day, going back to the whole question that Annie asked, uh, yeah, it definitely is The Last Jedi that really received much worse backlash because at least with Despicable Me and Frozen, at the end of the day, the haters do look at it as just a movie. They don't see it as anything bigger than that. But with The Last Jedi, the haters of those, they really take it so personally and it just makes them look delusional and honestly just not worth listening to. And also, one more thing I would like to comment, I think we can all objectively agree that The Last Jedi is not the worst thing that came out with the Star Wars name attached to it. I mean, for God's sakes, we have the whole prequels as living proof, and do I need to remind you about the holiday special? I'm just saying. Now, our next question that we do have right over here is going to be coming from Aaron, aka Lindis of the Lorca tribe. And uh, Aaron actually asks a pretty interesting question. How do you deal with trolls on the internet? Well, there are several ways that people would go do it. And honestly, for me, I feel like it's probably for the best that you would just ignore them. Don't give them the attention that they want. And essentially, uh, you probably know the expression, don't feed the trolls and stuff like that. And for the most part, it's probably for the best that you just do that. I mean, a lot of these people, they just want to bully you and they just want to give you a hard time. And the reasons can vary for so many things. And for the most part, though, it's usually for their own personal entertainment. And it's nothing more than just that. Like, they could be screwing you over just because they're bored and that's it. So, really... All you can do, and it's probably for the best, is just not give them the attention that they actually are seeking for. So, often than not, it's probably for the best that you just ignore what they're saying and just block them so that basically they don't have to harass you or they don't have to troll you with whatever that they have planned for you or anything like that. But I will say, um, there are a few exceptions though, but honestly, this is something that needs careful precision. There are ways that you could pretty much act like Bugs Bunny, and you can go and counter troll the troll, if that does make sense, and you can go and end up being in a position where it does make yourself look good and make the troll look like an absolute fool. But again, this is something that you really have to be careful of and you have to make sure that you're in a position where you know that you can screw them over instead of them screwing you over. So you have to really be careful if you are going to enter into that territory and if you want to try to confront the situation head on. But for the most part, dealing with trolls and stuff like that, it's really not worth it. And it's probably for the best that you just block them, ignore them, and make sure that they don't have a way to contact you in your life or on social media or whatever. So 
I think that's probably for the best and probably my best advice that I can uh, give you in terms of dealing with trolls. Okay, so on our next question, this is going to be coming from Tintin Fan. And funny enough, this is not a question related to Tintin. Uh, but anyways, Tintin Fan asks, Would you say that movies like Captain Underpants or Storks are the cartoony animation style more commonly seen in Sony movies done right? And I just want to go out and start by saying that there really is a bit of a misconception about me that people have where they think that I absolutely hate animated films that are trying to be cartoony. Like, if there's a computer animated feature that does have a little bit of a cartoony style, then I would say that I hate it, especially when people would commonly think about my reviews of films like Hotel Transylvania or Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. But honestly, that is not true at all. In fact, I actually really do enjoy cartoony computer animated features. Like, they can be a lot of fun if done right. Now, that's kind of the biggest problem is that there are many ways that you can go and screw over with the cartoony animation style. Like, if it's honestly used to the point of trying to cover up a really bad script, or when you're trying way too hard thinking that that should be the highlight more so than the script itself, then honestly, you're not doing cartoony animation right. That is honestly trying to cover up the fact that you're not doing a good job at making a feature film. But there are plenty of those that actually do know how to use the cartoony animation style correctly. Rather it be as a clever way to integrate it into the story or to make sure that they would get the tone right along with good jokes that could actually convey that well onto the cartoony computer animation style. And there are plenty of examples that I can think of. Um, there are films like Inside Out that know how to take the cartoony style and try to integrate that within the world that the movie that is set in. Or there are films, for example, like uh, Captain Underpants, the first epic movie, where in that film, um, they're basically doing that style because that's how they look in the books. So it's mostly trying to stay true with the visual representation and the tone that the books have delivered. Kind of like a way from making it, uh, like translating the pages and putting it onto the screen. And then there are those, of course, that try to deliver some clever comedy with it. Uh, some good examples that I can think of include uh, the Madagascar films, uh, Storks, like Tinted Fan mentioned, and also another one that I have to say, and is probably one of the best examples of cartoony computer animation, the Angry Birds movie. Now, yes, say what you will about that film. Yes, it is absolutely stupid over the fact that it is a movie based on Angry Birds, for God's sakes. So, yeah, I do agree. It's not that good of a film, and it is pretty dumb. But I really do admire the work on the computer animation, where it does have a bit of that classic... Uh, Max Fletcher or Looney Tunes flair, but at the same time, it doesn't go too cartoony and it knows that it is still a computer animated feature and it still holds on to some dignity. So honestly, that is just a great example right there of how they would visually create this enjoyable animated feature where it's cartoony, it knows it's a cartoon, it wants to have a lot of fun with it, but at the same time, it wants to look good as a computer animated feature. I mean, you can only do the most that you can with the Angry Birds movie, and yeah, it didn't turn out to be that good of a film, but I will give credit to the filmmakers, to the artists, and to the animators that they did such an amazing job. So to answer your question, Tinted Fan, I would say yes, movies like Captain Underpants and Storks are cartoony animated features that are actually done right. And there are plenty of examples that where cartoony animated films are actually done right. Just don't look at the ones made by Sony Animation. And speaking of Sony, that would actually lead us to our next question, where it's going to be from Daniel Olinick. And Daniel asks, could you see someone hating Illumination the same way you hate Sony Animation or Sony in general? Oh, dude, I actually do see that very commonly. And honestly, the hate on Illumination Entertainment 
it's debatably much larger than how people say I hate Sony animation and all that kind of stuff. It honestly is actually pretty funny where people are desperately trying to make sure that Illumination Entertainment is trying to get as much hate as possible, kind of like the same way that the public hates the Emoji Movie and stuff like that. And honestly, the most prominent that I really have seen is in the comments section of uh, my review of Hotel Transylvania 3, where people just really went all out trying to say that Animat is wrong when he says that Sony Animation is bad. The real bad animation studio is actually Illumination Entertainment, and Animat should bash that more so than Sony Animation. <laughs> And honestly, I can guarantee you that a lot of people would be more okay with me if you would literally take all the bad things that I said about Sony Pictures Animation and their movies and you just move that onto Illumination Entertainment. And honestly, the craziest thing about all this, and I mean, I I'm just gonna say right now that if you're not a fan of Illumination Entertainment, that's honestly fine. But seriously though, don't freaking judge others with the way that they treat freaking Illumination Entertainment. I kid you not, I know for a fact that there are plenty of people out there who think that I'm a bad critic, or they would even go as far and say that I'm a bad person and a hypocrite because I don't think that Sony Pictures Animation is good, but I do think that Illumination Entertainment is good. Now, I'm just going to say right now, if you really think that I'm a hypocrite for not treating Illumination Entertainment the same way that I treat Sony Pictures Animation, that doesn't say much about me. That says more about you. It says more about you the fact that you are the kind of person that just cannot handle hearing opinions that are different than your own. You're just pissed off because I didn't bash Despicable Me as much as I did bash on Hotel Transylvania and Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. So again, that's not my problem. That's more your problem that says more about you and the way that you judge others. I'm just saying. Okay, so for our next question, things are going to get a little bit more interesting because this one actually does come from Patreon, more specifically from Red Bandit. And Red Bandit asks, how come you didn't talk about the songs in your review of Teen Titans Go to the Movies? And for that one, I'm going to answer it in a more broad way. And I don't literally mean Broadway, but more in a broader way, where it's not just going to reflect on Teen Titans Go to the Movies, because there are several reviews of animated films in which people did ask me how come I didn't go and uh, talk about the songs in that specific film. Well, the thing is, when I would discuss about the songs, those are specifically for movies that are legitimately musicals, where the songs are an actual key factor, and that they would have several musical numbers where I can highlight and actually discuss about them, because song and dance is actually a key factor in its storytelling. Now, it is true that there are some animated films out there where they would go and have one musical number or two in there, but they're not necessarily animated musicals per se. It's just a little musical number that's in there, and that's pretty much it. I think a good example as a comparison would have to be Equestria Girls and the 2017 My Little Pony movie. Now, the 2017 film, that one is a lot more of a musical because there are actually several songs that are in there. You actually do have several characters that do sing a song in the movie, and it shows that these songs are actually a really integral part into the storytelling of the feature. Whereas Equestria Girls, for example, yeah, it does have like that one musical number or two, but there are plenty of other songs that are featured as well, but most of them are just highlights and that's it. A lot of the songs that are in there are not necessarily used as a key factor in the storytelling. And it's the same thing for something like the Spongebob Squarepants movie as well. I know that one would have musical numbers like, say, uh, uh, Now That We're Men and Goofy Goober Rock, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a musical. It's just an additional thing that's in there. And I mean, debatably, you could argue that 
for non-musicals that do have those musical segments, you could pretty much take them out and it wouldn't necessarily make that much of a difference to the feature itself. So hopefully that would go and answer your question regarding movies like Teen Titans Go or the SpongeBob SquarePants movie or even uh, Equestria Girls, why I wouldn't necessarily go into the songs of those films because they're not musicals and I'm saving the songs aspect uh, for actual musicals. Now our next question is actually going to be from Toad8508 and Toad asks, do you think movie adaptations of books and video games should stay true to the original source material as possible? And to that one, I would actually say yes, they definitely do. Or at the very least, for the most part. Like, I do understand that there would have to be a few things that they do have to change or maybe add in a few characters or take away a few characters or even take away a few of the significant scenes. But that would mostly be because they need to actually adapt it onto a feature film. This is a different storytelling medium than video games or than books. And uh, the most important thing though, even though you don't necessarily have to go page by page onto it, what is very crucial is to make sure you stay true to the original source material. Rather it be from a book or a video game, it is very important that you have to stay true with what that source material wanted to say. As long as you can go and deliver the message or the tone of what those source materials would have to offer, then that, that is where you can actually go and succeed as an actual film adaptation. You need to make sure it feels just like you are either playing the games or reading the books when you are looking into the movie itself. Like a great example would actually be a movie that I've mentioned before, Captain Underpants, the first epic movie. Now that one is actually based on uh, the first book, the second book, and the fourth book. Uh, there really isn't much of the third book in there other than like a few references and that's it. But it actually does succeed as a film adaptation because it stays true to the spirit of the books. It does stay true in terms of some of the story elements that are in there. It stays true to the tone. And most importantly, it does stay true to the comedy and the art style that the, the books would have to offer. And it actually does feel like reading the books when you do watch the movie. And that's how it actually does succeed as an adaptation. So that's one good example right there. So yeah, for the most part, it is important that they would have to stay true, but they don't have to literally go page by page or level by level. As long as they can maintain the spirit of the original source material, then that's when you know you actually got a great film adaptation. Now our next question will be coming from PowerPup97, and PowerPup would ask me, what are your thoughts on Disney going back to doing sequels to their animated features like Frozen 2 and Wreck-It Ralph 2 or Ralph Breaks the Internet? Uh, do you think it's a good idea for them to be doing it or do you think it might hurt their reputation? And do you predict they will continue to make sequels to other films like Zootopia, Moana, Tangled, etc.? Well, honestly, in terms of their sequels, it really does depend. Like, for Walt Disney Animation Studios, they're only just beginning with just making those, and let's be honest, they're only making two. It's not necessarily something that they would necessarily really sound the alarms, like, okay, yeah, like, they can at least get away with making, like, a sequel to Wreck-It Ralph or Frozen, and that's pretty much it. Or, at the very least, as I'm recording it, that's all that we know. But what is interesting is that if they are technically going into the same direction that Pixar would currently be going, then yeah, I could see that their reputation would hurt only a little bit. Because when you do look at Pixar, or at least just Pixar in this decade, you'll find that they would mostly be making sequels more so than just original feature films. In fact, in the 2010 decade, Pixar has only released four original animated features. The rest are just sequels with varying results. There are a lot of them that are absolutely amazing and great, like Toy Story 3, Finding Dory, and Incredibles 2, but there are a lot of them also that they kind of fall flat, like the Cars sequels and Monsters University, where those movies don't meet up to the same expectations as uh, some of the other Pixar films that would receive massive praise and awards and 
all that kind of stuff. So it really does depend if they would be capable of creating great movies. However, I will say that I do have a very strong feeling that it would not necessarily last that long because I can guarantee you that all these Disney sequels that we are getting nowadays, it's mainly because of John Lasseter. Because John Lasseter was the head of Disney Animation and Pixar for quite a while and from there he did encourage to go and create their own brand of sequels which is why we got like all these car sequels, Toy Story, and then like even seeping onto Disney Animation with Wreck-It Ralph and Frozen and all that kind of stuff. I mean there is a big reason why John Lasseter wanted to stop Disney Toon from making any of those directed DVD sequels and he wanted to go and continue making sequels but at least with bigger quality or at the very least the same kind of quality that the previous films would actually have. But now that he's no longer running Disney and Pixar and Pete Doctor is taking his place, um, I have heard before that when 2020 is going to roll along, Disney and Pixar are going to stop like really enforcing sequels and stuff like that and focus a lot more into creating original content, which I really do hope that is the case. Or if they really are that serious in making sequels, then I do hope that at the very least, they can actually be really, really good. So, at least that is a little bit of my theory. But, yeah, I guess with the whole thing with the sequels and stuff like that, it would really depend if they can actually deliver something great with those follow-ups like Ralph Breaks the Internet or Frozen 2. Otherwise, they could go a little bit like Pixar where they're not necessarily that bad. They're still on top of the animation food chain, but they're definitely not like how they used to be where they were like the legitimate kings of animation. And so finally, we are going to go and end this off with our final question, which is going to be coming from Maximiliano Pena. And Maximiliano asks, I've got a pretty out of nowhere question for you, Animat. Do you like the band Queen? Any favorite songs from them? If so, are you looking forward to seeing the Bohemian Rhapsody movie? And uh, I'm going to be pretty honest with this one, and I'll just be straightforward. I'm just going to say this. Yes! Like, oh my god, I actually adore Queen. It's definitely up there as one of my favorite bands. Now, I'm not necessarily a big music guy, but I adore Queen, and I love their songs. Like... They're definitely up there among one of my favorite bands or one of my favorite music people, period. And many of their songs are absolutely legendary, but if I would have to go and look into my favorites or at least the ones that I love listening to all the time, like, admittedly a lot of them are some of the more mainstream ones. Like, of course, I do love We Love the Champion, uh, We Are the Champions, and I do enjoy uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, of course, but I also do enjoy, uh, I also really love Somebody to Love, and also, uh, oh, don't stop me now. Like, that is something that can easily get me energized. You know, having a good time, having a good time. I'm a shooting star, leaping to the sky. You know, stuff like that. And also, as for the movie Bohemian Rhapsody, now, I'm just going to say this right now that as I am recording this, the movie has yet to be released, but absolutely. Like, that's probably one of, if not the most anticipated a live action movie of the year for me like I really am excited to check that one out and me and my family are even prepping up and organizing to go and actually see that film so yeah I really am hyped up to go and check out Bohemian Rhapsody and to pretty much answer your question yes I absolutely love Queen and with all that said that is pretty much it with this episode of Q&A with Animat so I would just want to start off by saying thank you guys so much for watching and thank you to everybody who has asked me a question. Now, if you guys would like to go ahead and ask me a question and hopefully have it appear onto Q&A with Animat, then don't hesitate and don't hold back. Go ahead and ask them and you'll see. Maybe one day I'll actually go and answer them for you. But with all that said, once again, I would like to say thank you guys so much for watching and until next time, see you later, dudes.